Hello, church. This is Pastor Keith Fair of St. Matthew Lutheran Church in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, we are part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and this is our Bible study for the upcoming Sunday, the sixth Sunday of Easter, which is May 12th of 2020, this year. And uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the 13th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, as usual. Paul writes this. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Well, there's really no denying that Paul is a fantastic writer. This is a portion uh, that is almost poetic in its, in its beauty. It'd be best read by, you know, some actor, by, by Jude Law or Paul Bettany or, or, or Emma Thompson. I have no idea why the people that come to mind are all British. But to be honest, pastors struggle with this passage because we have this association uh, with it with weddings. Not that weddings are, are a bad thing, but in the past, this, this passage would have excerpts that were printed out on, on the, the napkins, on the bulletins, on the, it would be incorporated into the, the wedding vows, uh, engraved on the rings. It's like it was the rock ballad of the modern day wedding. And that is, is beautiful and, and it's a, an appropriate sentiment. This passage idealizes all that we love about love of, of all kinds. It contains wisdom about the, the self-sacrifice and attention paid to the other that, that healthy, successful relationships need. And it's so it would seem perfect then for the uniting of two lives and two families uh, in, in the best and, and most basic concrete example of community that exists in our daily lives, living under the umbrella of God's grace. But ironically, that's pretty much the complete opposite of the situation that Paul was addressing in Corinth. To echo just a little bit from last week, Corinth is an ancient city in Greece on this narrow isthmus of land that connects the Greek mainland with the Peloponnese, this large irregular peninsula that extends south into the Mediterranean Sea between Italy and modern day Turkey. This strip of land is only about four miles wide, and there's a seaport on either side of it, one at the Ionian Sea and one at the Aegean Sea. 
uh, and, and it is vitally important for trade so that ships do not have to sail all the way around this peninsula, the Peloponnese. There is a canal there now, but there wasn't in ancient times. They attempted to build one in the first century and it failed. They didn't get around to it again until almost 1900 years later. Only now it isn't used anymore because it's too narrow and shallow for modern trade ships. It's only used by, by tourist boats and, and private vessels today. Paul probably settled in Corinth um, for a span of time in the early 50s of the Common Era. And while he there, he met a married couple named Aquila and Priscilla, who had a, a hand in forming a house church that met in their home in Corinth. When Paul left there after about a year and a half, he spent some time in Ephesus, which is in, in part of what we know today as Turkey. And while he was there, he was receiving reports from the church back in Corinth. Maybe they are letters, uh, maybe they are oral reports. We know they come f as representatives from a woman named Chloe, uh, whom we unfortunately know nothing about. Uh, but the word that Paul gets is that there is awful, awful discord sown in this Corinthian congregation. Uh, discord over matters of worship, of dietary practices, of, of sexual ethics, of classism and discrimination, and of the topic that we're addressing today, spiritual gifts. When Paul writes in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 13 about tongues and prophecy and knowledge, he's not just speaking about random human qualities. He's speaking about the personal gifts, the spiritual gifts that he has enumerated in Romans and in Ephesians, uh, and also here in, in the first letter to the Corinthians back in chapter 12. And in fact, that conversation will pick up in chapter 14, and it would seem that he's kind of interrupting that flow here. But I'll come back to that in a second. First, I want to say this about, about Paul and spiritual gifts. Paul is not a systematic theologian. He is not writing exhaustively about all the potential gifts of the Spirit. He doesn't fully define them. He doesn't place them in this structured relationship with each other. The best analogy that he comes up for it is actually presented in the previous chapter, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, when he says that the congregation is a body and these gifts interact with each other as parts of a living, growing, shifting organism. And so spiritual gifts as a subject is not really a clearly defined teaching in the New Testament. So Paul points out that all of these gifts are individualized in the congregation, and that's a wonderful thing, but they are all needed together. And this chapter, here in the middle of that discussion, emphasizes that love is more important than any and all of the gifts of the Spirit. Love is what integrates them into that living, breathing body of the church. The Corinthian church was a, a mixed bag of Jewish and Gentile converts, of, of working class and poor people and, and wealthy persons of, of Greek and Roman and Hebrew cultures, people that were young and old, men and women, single and married and widowed, slaves and free citizens. And there are both benefits and challenges to the diversity of this social group. But here, that diversity devolved into discord, into rival factions. Rather than being enriched by their differences, the Corinthian church became fragmented. And for Paul, this diversity is non-negotiable. He firmly believes that all of these individuals have been called together by God. But unlike at a wedding, his poetic tribute to Christian love in chapter 13 is not an acknowledgement of unity which already exists. We're not ready to just pronounce the vows now. It's a call to action, a call to reconciliation and to community. Now, at the beginning of the chapter, Paul, despite all that he has written elsewhere, even here in 1 Corinthians, about the efficacy of spiritual gifts in the worship life of the congregation, here in chapter 13, he downplays them all in favor of the unity of the congregation. The very last verse of chapter 12 
says, I will show you a still more excellent way. And chapter 13 concludes with faith, hope, and love. Paul places love as the third part of that triad to give it prime attention, even adding, and the greatest of these is love. Now about that particular love, a biblical commentator named Shively Smith, no, I don't think that she's related to our pastor Kevin Shively, but she writes this, make no mistake, the love Paul is talking about here is not passive and fluffy. This kind of love is an up at dawn, feet on the ground, tools in hand working kind of love. It builds communities. It nurtures positive social interactions and not just social networks, which many of us have come to prefer. Paul's declaration of love unifies. Love is the way by which we talk to each other, eat with one another, fellowship together, and affirm all. Love transcends our self-imposed caste system and personal biases. It forms whole and holistic people who are anchored in the well-being of others. Love will not let us down if we genuinely live in it together. I think that's a really powerful statement, not only about this passage in Corinthians, but about uh, our understanding of love in a Christian context. For me personally, as I think about the pandemic situation that we are living in right now, and especially as this trauma drags on and becomes normalized now that we are more than two months into shelter at home orders here in Pennsylvania, there's arguing between our elected leaders and, and between citizens at various levels over remaining in quarantine versus getting commerce and the economy up and running. And I know that people are suffering, not only those with the symptoms of the coronavirus, but those who've lost their jobs, their incomes during this time. I know folks who are on unemployment. I know folks who have lost their livelihoods but are not eligible for unemployment. It's a hard time, a tough time. And we all want things to get back to normal. But my concern is that we place the security of some above that of others. How will ending the quarantine too soon or, or too quickly put people at risk, especially the more vulnerable in our population, the elderly, people in nursing homes, people in prisons, people with other complicating illnesses. You know, I know the odds. If I contract COVID-19, I'll probably survive. But my wife with her medical history, she may not be so fortunate. Same with my mother. If I'm carrying the disease and I don't know it and I pass it along to her, she has a pre-existing lung condition. She'll almost certainly die. Same with my mother-in-law. What happens when the hospital beds are filled with COVID-19 patients and the cancer patients and surgical patients are pushed out? What happens if this disease resurges and the economy suffers even more deeply than it already has? What I think Paul would ask us is, what are we willing to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of the survival and the well-being of our neighbor? And I'd love to hear from you how you might answer that question. Feel free to email me, call me, reach out to me on Facebook. Let's wrap up with prayer. Loving Lord, you have showered your word with faith, hope, and love. Help us to be faithful to you and to offer hope to those in need and to love all your children. Amen. Until next time, be well, stay safe, and God bless.